Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, this is Keeping the World Company. And today we have uh, Chief Judge retired Shackley Rafetter from the Second Circuit and Vicky Caetano, interested citizen, former first lady. Wow, what a what a panel! Fabulous. And we're going to talk about the uh, the diaspora, which is the Chinese diaspora, um, which uh, Hawaii is definitely included in that. Uh, welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. So um, I just want to tell you a couple of things that caught my attention this morning. Number one is that uh, uh, Chinese and Russian ships and bombers are flying together in joint formation all around the world, mm -hmm. including in the Pacific. That's very troubling. Um, the other thing that's even more troubling is an article that appeared in SWP, which is a German newspaper of some repute. It talks about the diaspora, the Chinese diaspora about around the world. 60 million people are in that diaspora. And what is happening, what we see happening here in Hawaii and in the mainland is happening in Germany the same way. And it's very scary. This article is very scary because it sounds so similar, so familiar with what we see and understand here in Hawaii. How Xi Jinping is using the diaspora in order to gain advantage, Te technology, mm -hmm. diplomacy, business, what have you. And to the extent that a few years ago, this was kind of a loose movement using the diaspora. Now it's not loose at all. Now it responds to the top echelons of the Chinese government. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start with you, Shackley. Um, you know, what, to your knowledge, is happening, uh, and how is it revealing itself in Hawaii? Okay, uh, I think we ought to take a step back, though, and define what we what we mean by the, the diaspora. Uh, I did look it up a little bit, and what I found is this, is that the uh, Chinese diaspora is, there's 10 million plus in Indonesia, 7 million in uh, Thailand, six uh, almost seven million in malaysia and next uh in terms of numbers is the u.s with about a little over five million people who and that's a u.s cens census people who identified as being chinese so that that's the number of people uh they're largely about 80 percent is spread through five u.s states california is about 40 percent of the total and then after that new york hawaii uh, Texas and New Jersey, um, and uh, I've I've had a friend in China tell me once that uh, the only place you might not find a Chinese restaurant is in Antarctica, and maybe if you look hard, you find one there. So Chinese diaspora is all over the world. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the or the the Chinese government operates primarily through the United. Front work department to influence that diaspora overseas, and also the state security service of the PRC, which is basically like the CIA in America, which which runs spies and uh, and clandestine efforts and so on. But the United Work Department sponsors organizations like uh, this here. Anyway, United Work Front Work Department sponsors things like the Confucius Institute at American universities, which are used to influence um, students and university programs. They also uh, influence, or they provide, I guess, Chinese language training. And one interesting uh, side note on that is when I was in China a while back, a friend of mine told me uh, that uh, when Chairman Mao was in charge, he changed the ch the written Chinese language, and um, it, and, and I said, well, why would he do that? You know, because the, the, one of the things that uh, someone who can read the written Chinese language can do is read the ancient texts. And uh, he said, well, uh, is to make it easier to learn. But if you look at <laughs> if you look at how it stands now, it doesn't look very easy to me. But in any case, in Taiwan, they didn't make those changes. So they're, they're actually teaching a version of uh, um, Mandarin, really, um, that's been altered by the, by the you know, Chairman, Chairman Mao and, and, the, and the party, which is, I thought, interesting. And I, have, I, I, I 
ascribe a, a uh, uh, you know, a suspicious reason for that. I think that that was to cut people off from their history. But that's just my supposition. Anyway, uh, w they make uh, political contributions. Uh, two uh, famous instances are the Representative Swalwell, if you remember, he had a chi alleged Chinese spy on his on his uh, staff who was involved in fundraising to support his campaign. And the other one that comes to mind is uh, Diane Feinstein, Senator Feinstein, had apparently had a um, a Chinese spy uh, on, as her driver for 20 years. And uh, so they're, they're, they do many other things, film festivals, cultural festivals, uh, Chinese National Day, uh, visits by Chinese officials sponsoring uh, uh, research at American universities and uh, keeping track of Chinese students who are here studying at different universities. Um, and, uh, and, and then keeping track of dis Chinese dissidents who've come to America, such as people who are in Falun Gong, uh, as you know, an like, uh, organization that was horribly uh, oppressed in China. And that's kind of the general field that uh, I'm aware of. Yeah, let me, let me just uh, add that in that article in the German newspaper, um, they said that the, when we talk about the diaspora, we're not just talking about people who were born and raised in China. We're talking about people who are Chinese. And they uh, they may have lived overseas for a long time, but the, the PRC is, you know, considers them part of the diaspora and reaches out to them in the same way. Vicky, yeah. uh, you, you're familiar with the police station affair in Brooklyn, uh, how, the, how the Chinese government actually had a police station. Uh, and they were monitoring the movements and the, the conduct of Chinese people in Brooklyn. That was really, really scary. It is scary, Jay. And, you know, look, we're living in an extremely precarious time right now. You've got two very powerful countries led by two extremely uh, powerful leaders who seek to change the world order. I mean, I think Putin and Xi Jinping want to show America that there's a new world order. I think one of the great uh, points to discuss is whether they would uh, want to collaborate together. And I don't think there's collaboration between the two of people like them, uh, but to combine forces in order to teach uh, our European allies in the United States a lesson or whether they feel independently they can do that. Regardless, uh, we're really living in a very precarious time. I think uh, they will use all means uh, and they call it strategic placement uh, of their intelligence in order to penetrate um, and, and create the influence they need to gain a stronger uh, you know, level uh, of confidence and, and to be able to win whatever war, however they are going to engage in that definition of war against the United States. Hmm. You sound concerned, as I am, as Shackley is. So, um, you know, it, th it seems clear that they're uh, surveilling and doing cyber on us. Just a couple of examples of that. We have uh, Chinese ships off uh, the islands, off Kauai, for example, on a regular basis, looking over the Pacific Missile Range. Uh, trying to figure out, you know, what, what our missile traffic is over there, what our technology is. Um, we have those balloons. Nobody can tell me those balloons are innocent balloons. They're not. Um, and we have, uh, on the college campuses, we have Herculean efforts, not only to um, recruit um, people who would report back, but also, it doesn't always work, but they try, also to do cyber, um, cyber, cyber uh, espionage on our work product, our science uh, in the universities. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a significant um, conference at, at which UH attended um, to uh, get a handle on the Chinese efforts around the country um, to take our intellectual product from the university. So it, it seems clear that there's a, you know, there's a, there's a comprehensive effort going on um, to um, find out everything they can find out, uh, including every manner of technology you can think about. 
And where I get stuck is I, uh, Joe Biden uh, sends Anthony Blinken over there. He sends Janet Yellen over there. They were a, a regular pathway of um, senior uh, diplomatic officials going to China, uh, trying to talk to the military, but not, not succeeding in that way, um, but uh, making, making friends. Query, is, is that helpful? Is it uh, got a benefit to it, or is it naive? Vicki. Well, you know, I uh, have some friends who spend time here and also in Singapore. Uh, and very interesting, they're Chinese Americans, and they actually believe uh, that the United States needs not to feel so threatened, as you and I perhaps feel, but to simply acknowledge that we're no longer the world power and to understand that there are others in influence now, including China, Russia, uh, Russia, and to create a more collaborative effort. So it seems like their uh, uh, approach of brainwashing is already starting to have impact even on my friends. So uh, I, I do think that it's very challenging because, you know, uh, I think President Biden is trying all diplomatic means to try to engage China. You know, as it is, we are already at war indirectly with Russia. We're not their friend. Do we really need to take on another enemy? So uh, I think he has to try that. what he is doing. Um, we don't want to be in bed with them, uh, but do we really want to go up and fight another you know, country like that in, in another way of war, either way will certainly, and is the United States, are we prepared? Mm -hmm. yeah. We've had peace for so long, perhaps, uh, and, you know, we're a little bit more uh, complacent now. Yeah, exactly. It just, it doesn't seem equal. It, it seems disparate somehow. On the one side, um, they have a very specific, obvious intention of, um, you know, of, of winning this competition, if you will. Competition may be a light word for what I'm thinking. Um, and on the, on the other hand, um, we, we need to have a relationship with them, as Joe Biden understands. But how do you handle a, 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 an imperfect situation like that, where one side really wants to be aggressive and the other side more and more finds itself on the defensive? Well, one thing we could do is set up a U.S. cyber command. We, didn't we do that already? I don't think it's. I'm th I'm thinking on the uh, the size of the U.S. Space Command that we have now. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but the, it, the reason I think that is is, uh, and Vicky and I were talking about this before we started. Is according to Sun Tzu, right? Who is the man who who. Uh, uh, basically spells out the way the Chinese think about warfare. Uh, winning without fighting is is the is the best way to go forward. And this whole business of influencing the diaspora and, and uh, cyber warfare and you know, all the different ways that they uh, come at us uh, is, I think, aimed at that. Now, whether they'll attack Taiwan or not, I don't know. I do worry about that. But I think that they're going to try this first. And uh, I, how do we protect ourselves? Well, I think we have to be sophisticated and, and, and uh, work, work in new ways to do that. Uh, uh, on the police station issue, there is a virtual police station, I understand, on WeChat. WeChat is the, is the common uh, internet. Uh, I guess it's like... Uh, uh, Facebook uh, in China. If you travel around China, you use WeChat to talk to people, and they monitor that. Uh, in fact, I canceled my account because they wanted to change the uh, privacy uh, uh, agreement. I said, "Oh no, I'm not agreeing to that." <laughs> not that I have anything that they'd be interested in, but um, that's the best I can think of. Is to is to you know when I read the other day that the Chinese had hacked our government. Uh, information again, you know, that really depressed me. Can't can't we do better than that? Mm -hmm. Well, we're we're an open society, and and that's you know that's the way it is. That's the way we've come up. And as an open society, there are ways to get 
to get in on us. Uh, I, I read that um, there's a Chinese uh, fashion website, okay, that sued an American fashion website for some kind of claim of unfair competition in the state of New Jersey. So here's a Chinese company taking advantage of our legal openness, if you will, our rule of law to sue an American company. Uh, it just doesn't seem to just try that by going into China and suing, you know, the, the Chinese website. Just try that. Not likely. So yeah, it just no. it seems terribly unfair because we're open. Well, there's another. But I think there's an effort in Congress now, is not there not to prevent uh, Chinese nationals from purchasing American farm property? I don't know how far that's going to go or whether that even be constitutional, but uh, there's a there's an awareness now uh, of this sort of thing. Yeah. So, uh, Vicky, you know, how about how about uh, Hawaii? Uh, where does Hawaii stand? I mean, we have a lot of military here. As I mentioned, Pacific Missile Range, but there's all of Pearl Harbor. There's there's a lot of uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, signals going in and out of Hawaii about uh, uh, secured things and. Uh, although we may not care enough, we certainly should care about national security. Uh, Hawaii somehow becomes, shall I say, a target? Yeah, Hawaii is a very strategic location, you know, and, and I think that we need to recognize that. I think sometimes that, that as residents, we don't. And I think that's a very good starting point, really, among the American people. We don't need to go... Uh, from not even discussing it to becoming paranoid. But we really must enlighten and be a much more cognizant society of what threatens us from outside our country. I think for many Americans, we're just not engaged enough in, in matters that, that pertain to national security. Uh, we've had democracy, enjoyed it for so long, and we don't realize the threat to democracy. And I think that's a very important starting point to have those conversations and to be aware that of these threats from China, from Russia. Uh, how do we, however, how do we cross, yeah, how do we not cross that line? Because as a country that really has the rule of law and, and appreciates our democracy, how can we clamp down on any threats to our, you know, cybersecurity? without being without losing our democratic values I, I think this is the thing that we struggle with you're right absolutely what, what a pro perfect way to put the question so exactly you know in terms of the military um it seems to me that we are we are exposed here and uh the question is what is the messaging you know i saw a piece by the uh, relatively new uh, uh indo-pacific commander and it, it was not encouraging. Um, he spoke um, in fearful terms about what China was doing. So on the one hand, if you if you read that kind of rhetoric, if you hear him speak, and he's a very influential man, obviously, you know, at the top, really the top of Indo-Pacific, um, you get worried. On the other hand, as Vicky says, you know, we have to we have to cool it, but you have to be careful about cooling it because you know China is very good. At, at cyber, it's very good, just as Putin is, at doing subtle propaganda, not only to members of, of the diaspora, but to all of us, to make us think, well, we, you know, we shouldn't be too excited about this. Let's try the open government, democratic way. Let's try to make peace. Let's do a, a Joe Biden approach on this. And so you have two forces at play. One force is the more paranoid force, and the other force is the don't worry about it force. How do we handle that? Well, I, I subscribe to the Theodore Roosevelt view of speak softly and carry big stick. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> De deterrence that they can see. If, if we'd have had adequate deterrence in uh, our dealings with Russia, Ukraine wouldn't attack. That's my view. Yeah, but they, well, they, they could get away with it. They got away with it in Georgia. They got away with it in in uh, uh, in Chechnya. 
And uh, so she thought he was, you know, and he got away with it in Ukraine in the, in 2014. So he went for it. And if you if you conduct your 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 foreign affairs in that manner, uh, you have to expect that somebody's going to try to take advantage of it, especially these nations that are aggressive in uh, in you know wanting to increase their influence across the world. So I'd say military deterrence for sure. Well, um, you, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt did not actually define what the big stick was. Uh, I think it's incumbent on us to talk about what the big stick is. I I was really un, unhappy to find that the Chinese Navy uh, has more ships than we do, um, and that the Chinese naval technology is ahead of our ships, and that in some ways the ships we have are old, the technology we have is old, um, and we may not be up to the you know up to the level that they have spent a lot of time and money developing. I mean, one of the reasons they do their espionage is to find out, uh, you know, what, what our technology is. I mean, and, and you know that in the Federal District Court of the state of Hawaii, in the state of Hawaii, there was a case not 10 years ago about a guy who sold uh, the stealth bomber plans to the PRC. Um, and they have that, you know, and uh, they didn't participate in the litigation. But a few weeks after the case was over, mm, presto digito, uh, the Chinese are flying their own stealth bomber, uh, and that's how it goes. So, you know, the question is, what is the big stick exactly? Well, as a military person, I, I, one thing I'll say is we have the best submarines in the world, and, and uh, the submarines will tell you there are two types of ships, submarines and targets. <laughs> <laughs> And although well, Teddy ships, Roosevelt did not say that, did he? Ships make a target-rich <laughs> environment, and and uh, closing some of the straits to access China would would have an immediate catastrophic effect on their economy. So we do have deterrent. Uh, Vicky, what about you know other countries in Asia? I mean, we do have the advantage, call it the soft power advantage. You know, the legacy of good relations ever since World War II with a lot of the, these countries all around, the, you know, all around China. Um, does that play here um, that the United States can have not a big set, a stick, but a, a soft power stick by having good relations with other countries in Asia? I, I think that's certainly helpful. And I think the Chinese government, they know that, you know, whether it's with Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, I think that, uh, but I think they're playing to the weaknesses that we have within our own country. And I would ask the question, is this why we are such a divided, polarized nation as we see now? You've got the extreme conservatives that, that you know, feel like we are being taken over by everyone. And then you've got others who say that that's not the case and, in fact, are even more liberal about the rights that uh, people from all over the world who come to this great country should have. And I think this is, this is creating one of the biggest challenges and threats to us as, an, as a nation, because divided, we cannot stand, we cannot be united. So I think we've got to look into our own country to see what we can do to pull people together. I think that's really important to counter the threats that we have with China. So, exactly, what do we do with the diaspora problem, as reported in the German newspaper, where you know you have lots of people who are on Xi's list, uh, who he's trying to influence and get to you know report back and all this. Um, what do we do in this country? I mean, we, you know, we we're not going to be racist. We're never ever going to have racist policy, not at the national level. Well, aside from what we have now, <laughs> but but that's a pariah to have. Uh, you know, kind of a racist approach to this. If you're Chinese extraction, somehow we don't trust you. That's ridiculous. That's you know that happened in the in the in the Wuhan uh, COVID issue. You know, which which uh, you know Republican Party capitalized on. But um, so my my question is, how, how do we handle the fact that there are a lot of millions of Chinese in this country? How do we handle the the fact that she wants to reach all of them and have them help him. Um, what do we do to defend against Taiwan, uh, a, a takeover of Taiwan, and 
more bases in the ocean at the South China Sea. Uh, what do we do to uh, improve our posture? That's a big question. A big question. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, I think deterrence uh, from a military point of view, they have to know that they'll lose if they if they take military action, and I think they would. But uh, with regard to the Chinese diaspora and and uh, influencing them, um, I think we have to just depend on our American values. The, one of the challenges, of course, is we have free speech. And we also have a right to privacy. So there are limitations on what the FBI, for instance, can do as far as surveilling people. And we have laws, pretty good laws about that. So we are, we are limited in that regard. But I, I don't think uh, there would be a law that would stop us from uh, finding out more about what the, the Chinese government is doing in our country. And that should be a high priority. Because mm -hmm. if you don't know, you can't do anything about it, right? And um, and it doesn't seem like they know everything. I mean, we have some general ideas about what's going on, but then we have the hacking of our government official records. I mean, the first time they did it, they got records which included the applications of people in the military and the government for for security clearances. That you know what that information is. That's that's incredible information on people who have top level security clearances in our in our military and government i mean you want the chinese having that That's you, you let your mind fly about what they could do with that yes um, but i want to give you a, 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 a kind of case study hypothetical exactly okay she has said that he wants taiwan by 2027 2027 is what three years and change away so we're you know we're on the brink of something with taiwan um, and, and let's say uh, he is unable to get Taiwan the way he wants. I mean, obviously, he's going to try to affect that election next year, isn't he, in Taiwan? They, they have an election. And he's, yeah. he's going to use his social media, you know, propaganda to reach the people in Mandarin, in Taiwan, and try to change the effect of that. Maybe he'll talk to his friend Putin about it. Putin's a past master <laughs> about propaganda. Okay, so let's let's assume uh, that he that does that does not work, and that he has to you know go go across the Taiwan Straits and and fly over them and scare them and even use kinetic war against them. Okay, now here we are in the United States, um, just off a very unpleasant experience, either supporting or not supporting Ukraine, where we have a divisive. Mm, environment in our in our congress and in our government um and we are faced with the issue of whether to do anything about protecting taiwan or not 1979 the united states in order to improve its relations with china de-recognized taiwan which was kind of a stab in the back to taiwan query you know whether there is unanimity on protecting and defending Taiwan right now among the people in the country and among the people in Congress. So there would be a debate, I suggest to you, about whether we should defend Taiwan or let it go. And of course, um, the diaspora might be a weapon that she wants to use. He might want to do a social media. He has enormous capability in that area to try to affect public opinion to say, you guys, we don't want another war. We had enough supporting Ukraine. We're out of Taiwan. What happens? Well, that's a good question. Uh, President Biden has said we would, we would protect Taiwan. Uh, so I assume that that's the administration's position. I think we could. Uh, in fact, do that, um, but but China has to be convinced of that in order to prevent an actual war. If there was an actual war, there's lots of ways that that China could be uh, degraded uh, very substantially and very quickly. Uh, you know, from a military point of view, but you, you know, we don't want to really get there. You know, we had this idea for a long time since Nixon and Kissinger went over there and reestablished relationship. Chairman Mao was still alive. That if we just did business, uh, 
China would change and everything would be okay. And that that approach has never worked uh, with an authoritarian regime. It didn't work in Russia, just didn't work in China. Uh, I had high hopes for it. I thought it was going to work. Why wouldn't it work? You know, there are more billionaires in China, I think, than any place else. I mean, it works really well. Uh, but um, it didn't. Um, the world well, order is changing. That, would you say that it didn't work or that it did work for a while? Well, but it worked. A different while. leader changes the narrative. Yes, I remember when he came into office and things changed immediately. It, it, I was there at the time and, and you could see the changes. Uh, and of course, I didn't know where it was really going to go, but uh, you're right. Times it, before that, times were very interesting in China. So, Vicki, let's take off on that, though. Um, you know, what could we do to get around this, aside from the kinetic war? Uh, what can we do to improve the relation? Really legitimately get around it. And and maybe it does involve business. Maybe it involves a fresh look at business. I mean, I think we, we lost our mojo there somewhere around 2010, uh, where we stopped doing business and stopped, um, you know, doing these entrepreneurial things in, in China. We, we weren't up to the task. A lot of people feel we were not as sharp uh, in, in making those deals. And you weren't just dealing with your you're opposite across the table. You were dealing with the PRC every time you try to make a deal. Um, but you think it's possible, at least logically, for us to get back in and the side door that way and do deals and achieve what, what Shackley thought was going to happen and what I thought was going to happen back 20 years ago? Well, I think we have to be very careful of that because I think the Chinese are extremely shrewd. And if you think about it, they opened the doors. Everybody went there invested capital, you know, uh, thinks that they're running and they, they are running very successful businesses only to then find that all of a sudden their business is threatened. And the Chinese, in essence, used our capital and our know-how to build these businesses and now the government owns it. So I think we have to be very careful that starting a business in China is totally different from starting a business in the United States. Uh, so I'd be careful, given the leadership uh, mindset of what they're doing, that everything that is done there is done with the mindset of how it's going to benefit them. Uh, I think we need to watch that, being aware of that. I think diplomatic uh, approach as much as can be. But at the same time, I see nothing wrong with really taking a harder look at what Shackley said, which is, you know, how access is provided. There's just no reason why some of these cases that have come up, why the United States, why did we fail uh, in these situations and provided for the Chinese really an ultimate, you know, jewel of information that they're able to hack into or people that they plant to Senator Feinstein's office. That's just unacceptable. So I think we have to be a, less naive and much more, uh, I, and I don't think that's racist in any way. I think that's just smart national security being much tighter about who we put in uh, key positions that threaten our national security. Yeah, it strikes me when uh, Diane Feinstein's driver was outed, um, there, there wasn't that much of a reaction by the United States. Uh, and, and when the stealth bomber plans were stolen, there wasn't that much of a reaction. We never really faced them down on that. And in fact, don't you think there's a better way to say, look, we've got your hand in the cookie jar. We're not going to allow that. You know, you're a bad boy. Uh, but we don't do that. We let it go. And then we and then we send a half hour uh, diplomatic staff over there to genuflect. That, that's not the right message, is it? Well, to what Vicky was saying, there, there's no way anybody that has any sense would go over there and start a business now. They just passed a law that allows the Chinese government to confiscate foreign assets and take foreign employees and put them in prison. If they That's think, a happy thought. They think, uh, it, if they think that it affects yeah. national security. And they also shut down these. There was like three or four organizations in China that did due, due diligence on Chinese companies. So if you wanted to invest in China, you would go to these companies and you'd say, look, is this a 
you know, is this a Tong Society organization? Is it mafia? Or is it a real company? Uh, and and these organizations would well, they've all been shut down and their computers taken away by the by the Chinese government. How, how could we possibly how could anybody make any sense make an investment in China now? Well, let, me, I, let me add to that. Let me add to that. I just hmm. heard uh, Kyle Bass make a presentation on this. He said, you know, the uh, Evergreen and the and the big uh, uh, real estate companies in China that are in financial difficulties now. Uh, apparently, they issued bonds both in yuan uh, uh, denominations and dollar denominations, which were sold to foreign investors. Well, they're not paying the dividends on the dollar-denominated bonds, but they're paying the dividends on the yuan-dominated bonds. <laughs> so anybody who invested in Chinese real estate is probably out of luck. What happened here? <laughs> You know, um, a few years ago, a fellow went to East West Center, Simon Winchester, wrote a book called Pacific. Yeah. And he had various chapters in the book about various places around the Pacific, their history, and what was remarkable about their current contributions to the Pacific. And, and this was before, as I recall, this was maybe just around the time that she was taking power. Um, but one point he made in the chapter on China was, you know, they have stood up. They are compelled, they are determined to stand up, um, and they don't like the West that much. And in the long term, they are always going to be um, not competing, but fighting with us and trying to get on top. Uh, and we, we're a long way from that. And we don't have the presence, or maybe call it the political will, to engage close to them. Um, the way we, we might have had we seen this coming. And, and uh, Winchester's closing thought on that, and this is my closing question to you, is uh, he said, you know, you just got to deal with the reality. We may not be able to compete with them, and they will, they, were, they are determined to compete with us, and they have a certain, um, you know, advantage in being an autocracy. They can make decisions overnight and implement them without any argument. Uh, so query, is Winchester right? Do we just sort of fall back and let them do what they want? No, uh, authoritarian regimes uh, uh, last until they don't. And that's usually pretty <laughs> good. Uh, I'm, I'm betting on our dem democratic uh, society where people can can uh, become, say crazy things and, and, and act crazy and, uh, and they're not put in jail for it. Uh, and they, but uh, it we have we have a society that has that has developed incredible creativity incredible there's no place in the world like uh silicon valley and the things that have been created there or spacex uh or 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 tesla or these i mean tesla is apparently the large the fast or the largest selling uh electric car in china now so I wouldn't bet on China. I'd bet on the U.S. Vicky, did, you your also on hear, this? did you also hear, though, that the Chinese electric vehicles have now surpassed the ones made in Japan? And guess who's buying them? The Europeans. Well, that would be shocking well, to me. The Europe, the, courtesy of the Europeans, we were brought World War One and World War Two. So <laughs> <laughs> consider that when you think about what they do. And, and on that, I just I want to offer you a, 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 the last story for your comment, and that is this. Um, you know, the Hawaii Bar Association uh, organized a, a program, which doesn't exist anymore, where we, um, we're going to exchange lawyers. We're going to send lawyers to China, and we're going to take mm -hmm. lawyers from China. And, and one of the revealing features about this is we never sent a single lawyer to China, uh, mm -hmm. not in that program. But we got plenty of lawyers who came from China. And of course, they had to be approved to come here. There was one lawyer who um, made all kinds of inquiry. Um, this is in the what, early, early aught years. Um, all kinds of inquiry about, about um, uh, renewable energy, clean energy, and what we were doing, and uh, solar, solar cells and um, you know, all the hardware that goes with, you know, the, the inverters, all that. And um, 
she was very, very, very curious. And she spent her time here, which was like one semester, um, learning about that. And I realized over time that she was on a mission. Later on, not long after, we see uh, China's um, solar cell industry, its solar panel industry go skyrocket because that was their mission. Their mission was to be number one in the world on manufacturing solar cells and panels um, and inverters for that matter. And so um, um, they are now. They are. And so it was all very friendly, you understand. Just a lot of questions from her um, about solar panels and cells and what Hawaii, which was ostensibly a leader in the area at the time, was doing. Um, how can we deal with that? Uh, it's all very curious. And the notion of exchange, right? I don't know if we still have exchange, but we had a lot of exchange for many years about you know how Chinese students and business people would come over and, and you'd show them through your factory and you'd answer all their questions and show them your technology and, and they would take it right back. So query, is that still alive? Is that something we should continue to do, Vicky? I think that given the situation now, you know, and, and I'd like to just step back and say, as a country, we should not change our democratic values. That's not what I'm saying, but I think we need to be much more diligent about, about who we, we give, give access, access to these to to what we have in our country in all industries. Uh, I, for one, would not welcome anyone from China, even a Caucasian. Doesn't matter if you're from China to come visit our business. I would not welcome that, and it's not because I'm racist. Far from it, but it's because I have to protect our company. And so it's the same thing. We have to protect our country. We have to get real and recognize that there is a serious threat to our country. And uh, in order to not have to, you know, be on the defense and, and play ball when it's too late, we need to be step up our situ uh, our, I think, guardrails now. And so I just be very careful about uh, who we put in certain positions, especially in in the computer world. You know, I totally agree that TikTok should not be available in the United States. I support that. Given the times that we are in, we need to be more realistic and more diligent. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Your, your thoughts on the same question? Well, I, I totally agree with what she just said. Uh, I'd like to sort of, uh, if we're getting towards the end here, make one final comment or observation. I was looking at the the waves of uh, Chinese immigration, which is the dis diaspora. Uh, the first, first wave was in the mid-1800s. And those Chinese people came to America and they built the western half of the transcontinental railroad. And they contributed hugely to the progress and success of the United States, and they did the same here in Hawaii. And now those folks are, have been very successful and made huge contributions to our country. And we, we shouldn't forget that in, the, in the, what sometimes sounds like anti-Chinese attitudes. No, we can't forget that. They're part of our country just as much as any of us. It's just that I think we have to recognize what she is saying. And um, and what the diaspora means to she, and how it functions in other places, so that we can get a, a more sophisticated view of things. And I think Hawaii is not a great risk, honestly, but there are other places in the country and the world that are at greater risk. Um, suffice to say, this is a dynamic issue, and it will change. The only thing that's constant for a while is. <laughs> Presentator for life, huh? Yeah, something like that. Okay, I think we're out of time. Vicki, can we go now? Thank you for having me. Thank Always you, Vicki. Thank you, Shackley. Great discussion. Aloha. Yeah.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.